climate and energy opportunities in South and Southeast Asia, um, I think this is a particularly relevant panel because obviously coming out of COP26 uh, and headed into COP27 and COP28 where I think the Global South is going to have a voice to say. Um, the, it's, it's clear that nowhere is the challenge greater or perhaps the opportunities richer uh, than in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, I think you're going to see, we all know, we're going to see the majority of energy demand growth come from the region until 2050. Um, you know, major economies in the region continue to show significant economic growth potential, uh, growing populations. I, I, I think this is a really dynamic region and particularly one where as you look to climate action, uh, you know, an urgent priority continues to be the displacement of coal from the energy mix. And I think we have a number of different pathways we can use to pursue that transition. Uh, and that's all still happening uh, in a period now that we're finding ourselves in where the conversation around energy security is also incredibly important. Um, and so this is a region now that is uh, really at the starting block of pursuing both energy transition, climate goals, and solidifying its energy security at the same time. And that makes the, uh, the pathways that it can take uh, extraordinarily diverse. And to that end, uh, we have a fantastic panel with us today. Uh, we have Robert Fee, Vice President of International Affairs and Commercial Development at Chenier Energy. Uh, we have Kavita Grandi, Executive Director at Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore. Uh, we have Binu Parthon, uh, Head of Regions at, the, uh, at IRENA. Uh, we have Desiree Tung, Deputy Director of External Relations uh, at the Energy Market Authority of Singapore, and it's particularly good to see Desiree because I haven't, see, I haven't seen her since like two years ago before the pandemic started, and I'm going to use this opportunity to head back, make sure I get back to Singapore International Energy Week. So I'm looking forward to that. And then lastly, we have uh, Derek Wong, uh, Senior Director of Government and Public Affairs at Accelerate Energy. Uh, how I want to start this panel, I think I'd like to turn to each of you for some opening thoughts and then open it up to the audience, of course, for Q&A at some point. But Binu, I'd like to, I'd like to start with you. Uh, Head of Regions is an awesome title, to, to, to say the least. Um, but it means I'm going to pin you with a bit of a tough ask, which is, you know, can you paint a picture of the region for us? You have a lot of diversity across the various, uh, you know, country contexts, uh, each pursuing their own pathway again, as I mentioned. Um, where do you see the development of the region's energy and energy security and climate story evolving? And what are the particular opportunities and challenges you see arising? Thanks very much, and uh, uh, again, uh, thanks for having Irina on this panel. We just launched earlier today the World Energy Transition Outlook, which provides a clear pathway for the world to decarbonize, uh, including in this region. And one of the key highlights there is that it is possible to have an energy transition aligned with the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement in a manner which uh, there are positive uh, uh, economic environmental and social benefits. So it's not something which adds cost, but there are benefits. For example, things like jobs, we see that there could be significant job growth in the region. Uh, so the overall picture is positive. And I just come here from uh, the MENA Climate Week where we had one of our uh, members, Egypt, confirm to us today that energy transition will be on top of their COP27 agenda. So. I think there is a clear direction in which the energy transition is happening, and it's not happening simply because of the environmental challenges or, so, or the climate change uh, rationale. It's happening because of the economics and the socioeconomics of it. Now, for the region as such, uh, I mean, we do work closely with ASEAN, and we are developing an energy transition roadmap for ASEAN 10, which we will publish later this year, which will show a clear pathway for countries in the region to move forward. And uh, taking advantage of the fact that Indonesia is the G20 presidency, and you will see that energy transition is in their global agenda, and we're working with the G20 presidency to ensure that this is underlined. Now, one of the big issues or one of the main opportunities uh, in the region has been around coal powering energy. And our cost analysis show that Coal is no longer viable as a power option, and for the last seven to eight years or so, renewable energy investments have outpaced coal and other uh, power options consistently. And what we are also increasingly seeing in the region and beyond uh, is that it costs 
more to keep operating uh, coal power plants compared to renewable energy investment. So uh, till then, things are clear. Now, when you try to increase the share of renewables in the region and beyond, there are concerns and there are challenges. Uh, and obviously, a lot of utilities in the region are worried about the instability of the grid when you go beyond 30, 40 percentage or so. So where we see a significant opportunity in the region is the flexibility technologies. So one is energy storage, and there are uh, uh, opportunities to make the grid a lot smarter and intelligent to address some of these variability. But also what we see as an interesting option is the regional interconnections, connecting grids across the ASEAN region. There have been a lot of efforts there. It needs to be supported by the political will to ensure that uh, the countries are connected. So every uh, one degree longitude that you go, you do have a saving of about uh, one hour of uh, energy storage or so. And that is something that you can achieve by, uh, by interconnections. And something which we are seeing, there's a lot of interest from the region and beyond is the role of green hydrogen and how that compares to other options like gas, etc. And here again, uh, the veto which we launched today, we believe that green hydrogen will ha be an important power to X technology, power to storage, etc. But again, it may not be the answer for all the challenges that you may have. There are sectors like aviation, navigation, uh, could also be some industries like uh, uh, chemicals or iron uh, and metals, etc. So it will have an important role for the uh, green hydrogen as well. So going forward, I think uh, we are very clear that uh, there is a roadmap with renewable energy at the center of it with electrification of the end users, particularly transport, driving a lot of demand for electricity, and uh, a, an important role for green hydrogen and also flexibility technologies. And here, as an example, uh, we are working with the Indonesian government on an Indonesian energy transition outlook, which we hope we will launch in Bali around September. And being the largest economy in the region, we believe that what Indonesia will do could actually be a, a, a model for other countries in the region. So we remain very optimistic. There are certain challenges currently around energy security, which we believe are short term and probably driven by more emotional uh, and other considerations. But again, if you take the long, medium to long term, the options are very clear, which is electrification. And with that electricity coming from renewable energy supported by flexibility technologies and green hydrogen. So this is where we see the region going, and we will continue to work with all our member countries in the region to support them on this pathway. Thank you. Thank you, Binu. I, you know, I, we, it's a great macro level overview of, of the region. I think it's a, it sets us up well to dive into uh, you know, what I hope is a bit of a, a country level case study in a way, and I'd like to turn to Desiree. Uh, Singapore, uh, is, a, is a major hub in the region across any number of uh, areas, you know, economics, innovation, wh what have you. Um, it's also one that set several very aggressive and very ambitious um, sustainability targets for itself. Uh, can you walk us through those targets? And I think in particular what's, what's of interest is what is the underlying strategy that helps you reach those targets. And again, I think pulling off of uh, you know, what Binu just mentioned, you know, how do those issues around uh, climate ambition and, and energy security, inter inter are, how are those interwoven with those various efforts? Um, thank you very much, Reed, and a big thank you to the Atlantic Council um, for inviting us back. I think it's lovely to be back in the UAE. I was just saying it's been two years uh, since we've been back, so it's lovely to see old friends. It's great to be here with uh, Kavita and Irina, and of course new friends. I think we've just met our friends from Shinair and Accelerate. Um, so I think Singapore, like every other nation, we are committed to our climate change goals and uh, cutting our emissions. Um, our recently NDC goal, we are committed to halving our emissions by 2030, uh, peak to 33 million tons of CO2. Um, so to that end, we recently released the Singapore Green Plan, um, and this sets out basically Singapore's plans over the next 10 years to really drive the low carbon energy transition. Uh, one of the key pieces of that is the energy reset. So the energy reset really looks at our four key supply switches uh, for Singapore. Uh, so the first switch is natural gas. 
Uh, currently, we're about 95% powered by natural gas. Um, it is the cleanest fossil fuel, um, and it, it will remain the, the mainstay um, of our generation system. But of course, we are looking at, um, you know, we have CCGT, so we have highly efficient uh, power plants. Um, we are also looking at, you know, how we can drive efficiencies um, through maintenance, reliability of our plants and all of that. Uh, this is the second big switch is solar. Um, Singapore, I mean, those of you, I don't know how many of you have been to Singapore. We're a small island. Um, we're blessed with great food beautiful gardens, but unfortunately we don't have a lot of natural renewable resources. Um, so the most viable for option for us is solar. Um, but I think also, as you know, as a small country, we can't cover the whole island with solar panels. Um, but nevertheless, we do press on. Um, we have actually increased our install capacity by four times um, over the last 10 years. So it's been a huge achievement for us and we continue to increase uh, the deployment. Um, in fact, we have committed to two gigawatt peak by 2030. Um, so that doesn't sound like a lot, um, but the other third piece is obviously we're looking at imports from within the region. Um, so we're actually looking at a low carbon or renewable imports. Um, so we're hoping by 2035 that will make up about 35% um, of our energy mix. And the final piece that we look at is low carbon alternatives. Uh, so we've recently invested over 55 uh, million Singapore dollars into low carbon research, into hydrogen, uh, CCUS. Um, I think that's one of the key pillars um, of Singapore is we're really looking at you know, how we can look at research and development and new technologies. Um, I think at the end of the day, that's why I think we, we come to events like this and, and look to build connections is because it's about the creativity of the human mind and technologies that's going to get us there and really push the needle. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Desiree. And I, I guess I might ask a quick follow-up question, which is, you know, Binu, both you and Binu mentioned, you know, uh, the ability of the, the interconnectedness of the region in so many ways, right? And does Singapore's, uh, you know, relatively advanced, you know, economic development and energy story in some ways position it to uh, be a leader in the facilitation in terms of facilitating those transitions of its neighbors? Uh, and what does what what do what does that inter international cooperation piece play within your clean energy strategy? Absolutely. Um Hello. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for that. Actually, international cooperation is a very important part. Um, I think building not only regional but international connectivity is really important part of the whole energy transition. Um, one of the big pieces uh, that the Energy Market um, Authority does is we organize the annual event, the Singapore International Energy Week, um, which we've had the privilege of Atlantic Council, IRENA, as well as CIS. Uh, join us. In fact, I, I know Shanir also speaks and, and hopefully Accelerate too will be able to join us. Uh, it's held at the end of October, uh, so it's been running for the last 15 years. Um, and really what SEW is about is really pulling together different players, different um, stakeholders to come together to really look at what are some of the energy issues that impact Asia and how can we come together to really kind of push the needle to bring us to that you know, next level of the transition. You know, what are the pathways? How are we gonna get there? And how can we work together to do it? I'm taking that as an invitation and I'm gonna run with Absolute. it. Absolutely, open invitation, anytime. Exactly. Uh, I think, you know, I, I might now turn to, uh, to, to Bob and, and, and Derek. I, the, there is, what Desiree just mentioned is as a part of this process, you know, I mean, to quote you, Desiree, gas still going to be a part of the picture. Um, and I think when you look in the other parts of the region, you know, again, where you're trying to quickly displace coal, and that appears to be, in a lot of ways, you know, a significant short-term goal. Uh, what does the role, what does gas, what role does gas have to play, both in terms of, you know, A, displacing coal, but B, positioning gas as a way to uh, facilitate additional clean energy transformations throughout the region? I might start with you, Bob, and then we'll go to Derek. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so one thing I, I think it's always important to remember when you talk about, you know, South or Southeast Asia, I guess we're focusing on Southeast Asia today, is how diverse uh, the region is. And so we're able to hear kind of the experience of Singapore. But within the region, we have a, a vast difference in kind of where those countries are in terms of their energy mix, as well as their climate ambitions. And so I think that's a good baseline to remember that we need to think about um, what those countries are going to pursue, and they might have different strategies. Um, and so I think part of those strategies, of course, has to be a, a heavy component of renewable deployment. 
Um, but because of the infrastructure and the near-term uh, demand for energy, natural gas has to play a, a role. And um, you know, I think in Southeast Asia, a lot of the um, demand uh, drivers are even going to be more pronounced in the next few years. Um, with the current kind of geopolitical situation and uh, demand in the LNG market. And that's um, economic growth um, and population growth, industrialization, um, as well as uh, I think one of the key components on the natural gas side is you're going to have a lot of uh, declining indigenous production um, in the region. And so in order to meet those economic growth targets um, and kind of fit in the infrastructure, as well as meet environmental targets such as improving air quality and climate targets through coal to gas switching. You know, natural gas can play that, and, uh, natural gas and, and LNG can play that critical role supplying the region. Um, you know, I think going forward, one of the, you know, we know how to do this in the United States in terms of building infrastructure um, and getting LNG on the water. Um, in the region, we've had some difficulties of late in terms of uh, building um, regasification infrastructure um, and kind of having regulatory reforms and so I think in order to kind of ensure that we have the coal to gas switching benefits in the near term from a climate perspective we really need to make sure that we focus on building that infrastructure on the gas side and then that helps complement uh, the growth on the renewable side. Derek I might actually pitch you the same question which is and I think you know Accelerate is, is in, an interesting case study here because, as Desiree mentioned, you know, not a lot of geography, you know, to, to put an import terminal on, and that makes a floating storage option like Accelerate particularly interesting. Um, how are you, what's your outlook on on the region? And I think again, similarly, you know, how do you see uh, your presence in the region, you know, being a value add to these clean energy transitions that that are still a significant priority over the long term, especially. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. And. I'll just first echo what Robert just said. South and Southeast Asia is a diverse region. You have a lot of different um, economies. You have a lot of different types of geography. You have island nations. You have nations that suffer from, from flooding. And so the idea that you have um, an energy mix and a transition that is specific to so the country is really important. Um, for Accelerate, we've, we've got almost two decades of experience building, developing, and operating floating LNG terminals. And so we have a fleet of floating storage and regasification units. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, so we say FSRUs. But one of the, the biggest benefits of FSRUs are the flexibility, the fact that they're scalable, the fact that they, they can be deployed more quickly, and they don't need the land requirements of, of land-based terminals. So if, you have, if, you're, if you're constrained like a Singapore or a, other countries in the region that, that have you know chains of islands, you can think about different deployment options, different uh, docking and mooring options in order to to be able to deliver that natural gas in the form of LNG. And earlier this this month, I'm based in Houston, and so we, Sierra Week came to Houston. It was back um, in person, and John Kerry, the special presidential envoy for climate change, said very clearly. Natural gas is a key component of the energy transition. Now, obviously, there, there, there are ways to make it more efficient, to, to abate the emissions. But a lot of the countries that we're talking about are trying to have an off-ramp from coal. And so LNG is a great way to bring down emissions, but be able to fuel economic growth. Um, in South Asia, Accelerate has been operating in, in Pakistan since 2015 and in Bangladesh since 2018. And we've seen a difference in, in the deliveries uh, and the, the diversity of supply options. When, when domestically produced gas is, is on the decline, you need to be able to have that security of supply to accompany the pathways to decarbonization. And so being able to, to quickly and... and um, responsibly build out that infrastructure, I think that's a really key part of the equation. Kavita, I want to turn to you, and I apologize for making you wait. You know, I, I'd like you to kind of bring us back out to this, this perspective on, you know, how do we make this all sustainable, right? How do we make sure that we keep 
uh, our climate targets at the center of our, you know, of our ambitions as, uh, you know, as the region continues to grow and become more, becomes more energy hungry. Uh, natural gas and LNG providing a, a strong, you know, base of production there, but also you still need to pursue those renewable energy opportunities. You know, even if it's limited solar, even if it's electrification, hydrogen, as Binu mentioned, is a huge is a huge piece of that. You know, how do all of these pieces fit together into a sustainable energy ecosystem? So I think if I take the Singapore example to start with, um, there's a need for clear messaging. So in Singapore, um, like what uh, Desiree mentioned, um, you know, there's very clear messaging from the government uh, via the Singapore Green Plan, which sets the goals. And, and it's a, like we say, it's a live document where it can change, but it always changes for the better. Um, so that's one thing that I think uh, uh, we need in the region is very clear policies. If you ask me, there's one thing that's really um, could accelerate uh, would be policies. The minute you see that there's a will from the government, if you look at Indonesia, we can see that shift in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, uh, and, and you can see things moving already. And uh, we see it very clearly because our members, uh, while Singapore is a great market, but it's not a big enough market. So we look at Southeast Asia as a market for our members. And you can see which are the countries that they are able to deploy projects in. Um, so I think a diversity, and there's no one size fits all. So it's going to be different. Uh, and, and even in terms of mix between the type of renewables or its gas, it's going to be different for each country. Um, that's what I feel. And, and we should not try to box it up or have a formula that applies everywhere. The other thing I think which I've seen working in this space for a long time that there's a lot of need for capacity building in the countries around us. Um, and as CIS, we have a program together with the Singapore government, Asian Development Bank, and, and we execute the, those uh, uh, sort of capacity building uh, program where we work specifically with policymakers. And, and uh, you talked about um, grid intermittency. I think that is a nightmare for a lot of policymakers in the region. What is going to happen to my grid when you start pumping in all those renewables? But then we have solutions, like you mentioned. Uh, I mean, in Singapore, we've, uh, we have a lot of emphasis on demand response. Um, there's storage technologies. There's various softwares that are available now to, to even out that intermittency. Um, so yeah, so I think we need to talk more about it and, and uh, talk a lot more to policy. I think the private sector is ready, but what is stopping them is um, very stable, clear policies that will make it work. I want to draw on an item that's been mentioned a couple times thus far, and that's the that's the international partnerships and cooperation piece. And I'll turn, you know, I'll, I'll toss this to you. Uh, the, you mentioned, you know, cooperation within the region on, you know, interconnections, et cetera. But yeah, you know, we've just heard uh, from Kavita that, you know, looking outside the region uh, for assistance for shared learning. Um, and of course, you know, both, both Bob and Derek, you know, are, are bringing their resources to the region. Um, how does the international partnership piece work? And I think, you know, how does the international partnership piece work? Which, when it's in which non-regional countries, you know, uh, operate in the region on good faith, right, uh, as, as good partners. And what are those principles that should be adopted as uh, folks in, continue to engage with the region's energy development story? Uh, at the region level, uh, just to take an example of uh, Africa, although out of context, uh, we are working with the African Union to develop a continental master plan for electrifying all the countries and creating a single electricity market. So at the region level, it's important to have institutions with the right mandate to create common markets for electricity and energy. And that's a major uh, important factor. And again, having institutions like you know ASEAN, hopefully with the roadmap, could do more. And then it will be followed by national policies. But at the international level, uh, and you made this uh, important point that uh, uh, we've now created, for example, the collaborative frameworks at IRENA, where our 184 members, which account for like 
98% of the global energy consumption, where we have this space where, uh, as you mentioned, Kavita, uh, there are countries in Southeast Asia which are worried about if the renewable energy share goes up beyond a certain point, what do we do? Do we bring in natural gas or do we bring in some spinning reserve uh, from coal to support that? And they have an opportunity to talk to Colombia as to how they integrate grid level storage on their supply side and how that's competitive than some of these uh, on-demand sources, et cetera. So we're creating that uh, framework. But again, that just two policymakers or regulators talking to each other that needed to be followed up by action on the ground. And here again, as Kavita mentioned, like Indonesia has now put in place a carbon tax. Huh? And it's coming right from the top, from the finance ministry. And that will give the right signals as to which are the energy options that the country would like to promote. And uh, that actually translates to uh, actual revenues or incentives for the private sector. And it sends a very clear signal to the private sector. And then they can make these investments. So uh, I think in a sense, uh, there needs to be more uh, cross-fertilization of ideas, like the collaborative frameworks. And just as an example, something which we launched last week is a issue around critical minerals, which we believe that uh, whether it's going to be natural gas or electrical storage will be determined by critical minerals, where they come from, at what price point they are. And I think there is an opportunity to collaborate on that. So. In a similar way, IRINA will create more uh, platforms for exchange of ideas, but again, that need to be uh, driven in the regions by very strong regional institutions with the mandate and the drive to implement that, and then to the national level. And then we will have successful cases. And I think in West Africa, we've seen an uh, institution like ECOWAS do that to some extent, and we have this in Central America also, and we do hope that Southeast Asia can, it has the potential and uh, the leadership in several countries, and if we can do that at the region level and move that to the national level, then we have a very good model in the region. Thank you. I'm going to resist the urge to jump into the critical minerals bag because that's one of my favorite issues, and we'll just it'll ruin the topic of the session. We'll spend all the time talking about that, but I think it does bring up a an issue that I, I might I might respectfully disagree with you slightly in, in reference to your comments about energy security and whether or not those are you know short term considerations and just considerations of the moment um, because I think when you when we start thinking about the you know the, the balancing you know sup balancing which supply chains we are or are not dependent on whether that be a you know a natural gas supply chain or a, or a minerals and materials supply chain um, those are considerations that I think have to be met and to be uh, you know to be fair to Bob and Derek I think there is a little bit I think there's a justifiable concern in some ways that you know as uh, the rest of the world begins to think about you know LNG as an energy security solution uh, you begin to you know the region can also run into supply you know a tightened supply chain of its own. And how, you know, from your perspective, I'd also be interested to hear uh, Desiree's thoughts on this, uh, given you know, that uh, natural gas is, I think, number one, switch number one, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, you're looking, if gas is that solution, you're looking at a tightened market, you're looking at a market that, you know, might not offer as much energy security um, as other options. Or will. I think it's an interesting debate. So I'll turn to Bob and then uh, Desiree, and of course, Derek and Kavita, I'd love for you to weigh in. Yeah, so I think um, a panelist on the, the last panel talking about um, European energy security um, uh, used a quote that um, diversity is the only form of security. Um, and I think that's true in Europe, and that's true in Southeast Asia, and that's true whether you're talking about energy sources or you're talking about critical uh, materials. Um, you know, diversity is the only form of security, and you need to pursue all of these different, um, uh, all of these different policies and, and, and all of these different sources. And I don't think that they have to be, you know, um, uh, natural gas infrastructure is going to support renewable development, um, and so they can kind of, they can work in tandem, especially when the, the demand is, is so great. Um, and I also think it's important to, uh, I really liked kind of thinking about this from, uh, you know, adding the climate perspective, a comment that Kavita mentioned about policy and messaging, um, is we need to be, I think, um, consistent about how we think about these issues. You know, in the last few years, um, it, particularly in the West, we've had this 
you know, pretty aggressive um, shift on natural gas. Um, and I think that that, at least in the West, kind of misses the role of natural gas in Southeast Asia and, and the rest of Asia. Um, you know, in COP26 in Glasgow, we just talked about and, and reached an agreement to phase down coal. We didn't reach an agreement to end coal. Um, uh, and so thinking about kind of are we ending uh, coal and gas at the same time, I think is going to leave nations uh, not only insecure from an energy perspective, but also um, you know, not able to meet their economic demand. Um, and so I think, you know, again, thinking about the diversity of these countries, many of these countries um, have natural gas as a key part of their climate commitments. Now, some of them have different climate commitments than Singapore, which is more advanced, or, or European countries. Um, India talking about kind of uh, net zero by 2070. But that has to be aligned with their development. Um, and so I think that the climate aspect uh, actually goes hand in hand with the energy security aspect if you take a you know, realistic um, view uh, of the market. And I don't think that doesn't mean that we have to be ambitious. Um, I think that, that we just have to think about where that comes from. So we talk about critical materials and, and where those come from. They have supply chain issues. You know, it, I think the onus is on the producers, on the suppliers, uh, for us, Chenier in the United States, to think about how we improve our supply chain, and reducing methane emissions, increasing um, transparency around the quantification of greenhouse gas emissions that then benefit um, our uh, consumers of our product in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, upstream methane emissions are 30% uh, of the emissions chain, um, or sorry, uh, upstream of kind of the combustion of natural gas is 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. Methane is a huge component of that. Um, if we're able to reduce methane emissions upstream in the US, that does have tangible benefits uh, for Southeast Asia in their, in their um, consumption of LNG and globally. So I think the, I don't think that those have to be, um, you know, uh, exclusive of one another, um, but I do think that we need to be um, both ambitious and realistic about who should bear what burden as we think about um, achieving climate goals while also meeting energy demand. Desiree, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you again because you're our you're our country level representative here. Uh, you know, energy security playing a role. We've talked about you know the various security considerations within you know both supply chains, and I think Bobby correctly outlined how you know cleaning the supply chain is equally as important uh, responsibility on the supply side as it is on the demand side um, so how does how is Singapore thinking about these issues and I you know I think you know how is it thinking about these issues in the context of uh, the region as well absolutely I mean I think one of the things that we've all become acutely aware is how sensitive the energy market is to geopolitical I think the one big theme that I take away from here is not only is everyone driving toward the path of sustainability but I think energy security has certainly come to the forefront um, I mean, in Singapore, when we look at energy security, I, I agree with your comments on diversity. Um, I mean, even though we are, you know, going to be powered by gas, we are looking at imports, we are looking at solar. We, we even have geothermal. If you're not aware, we are also tapping into geothermal. Um, those of you who've been to Singapore, we actually have a hot spring. If you come and visit us, you can boil an egg. It's, it's a nice tourist thing to do. Um, but I mean, from a policy standpoint, we do look at what we call the energy trilemma. I think you cannot look at energy security in isolation. I mean, when you look at policy, you also have to look at sustainability. And at the end of the day, we're also looking at cost. Um, so I think the three things need to be looked at in balance. Um, I mean, I think when you look at the region, um, I think international cooperation is a key part of it as well. Um, you know, Singapore, we're very open in working with our, you know, international and regional partners, both in sort of ASEAN, APEC, G20. I think this is where international organizations such as IRENA um, also have a big part to play and cease within our ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of our take. But I think one of the other areas, I think Kavita and I were also talking about related to energy security, actually, is not as maybe as a sexier topic, but also energy efficiency. Yeah. is something that we're pushing a lot in Singapore. Um, it's also underpins. Um, because in Singapore, we price electricity right, um, so we don't subsidize. Um, so it's about sending the right uh, price signal of a consumption. But I think maybe, Kavita, you can add to that. Yeah. So exactly. I think you said it. Diversity is the best security. I think that's the mantra for the day. Um, so I think in Singapore, we are looking at every option that's available, starting with energy efficiency. So 
electricity has never ever been subsidized even though being the association there was a time when the whole world was offering feed in tariffs and singapore was not and we were literally telling the government you know our, our members are going to die if there's no feed in tariff but you know there was no no going there was no distortion of the electricity market and eventually um, you know the prices became uh, very uh, competitive and now we've looked at every option you know so there's 35 square kilometers of roof space in singapore we're going to make sure that's covered with solar panels and not just any solar panels we are pushing at efficiencies we have a lot of uh, dollars going into research and development we are looking at floating solar we are looking at bipv we are looking at every surface that we can cover with some renewable um and uh, I think the other thing that works very well in Singapore is the cooperation, the way the government and the private sector works together. So I think before people invest in a specific technology, they're very, very sure that they can go in and make the big investments there and that there will be no flipping and flopping uh, in terms of uh, uh, the message that's coming. I mean, carbon tax is one such example where it was declared that we will have carbon tax and we'll increase it at a certain pace. The pace got picked up this year, which was very happy news for all our members and it'll continue to grow. And I think that's what is providing the space for renewables to play in Singapore. So I completely understand that every country in the region is not like Singapore. But I think what is interesting is that all the countries are at different stages of development and we have so much to learn from each other. I mean, Singapore doesn't have everything. We don't have the market. We don't have the big market. We need to depend on Indonesia, maybe Thailand, Vietnam for the markets. We may have certain advanced technologies or certain solutions that have been tested in the Singapore market maybe can be applied in these countries. And we are constantly looking to work with organizations like the ASEAN Center for Energy or Asian Development Bank, World Bank, to see how we can uh, take some of these solutions to the region. Um, and that's an effort that goes at every level, at G2G level, um, you know, where the Energy Market Authority is working with the different uh, electricity uh, authorities in the region. And we as an association are trying to do a lot of that work at the private sector level as well. Thank you, Kavita. I think, you know, first off, totally agree. Energy efficiency, vastly under talked about, uh, particularly when you're talking about, you know, limiting demand growth or the severity of demand growth at least it's under, it's a critical solution i think derek I, I said i would come to you on this supply chain issue so i don't want you to you know be left out of this and i think uh and particularly you know when you talk about accelerates business model i think you're talking about a flexibility of solution right with that floating storage option um how does that flexibility play into this discussion around uh energy security and uh supply chains absolutely so you know getting back to this diversity brings security argument. Uh, I heard yesterday from the Albanian Minister for Infrastructure and Energy, Albania is a country that is largely dependent on renewables, almost 100% hydro. And she was talking about the need to diversify because if you have a particular dry season, you're worried about blackouts and brownouts. And at, so as, as countries think about the targets for renewables and the continued intermittency and storage issues, how can other sources like natural gas or LNG be an on-ramp or even a stabilizer um, to, to meet seasonality of demand? And our experience in Brazil, which again has a lot of hydro, has been that they've relied on LNG to be able to, to meet those, uh, those times of the year. Uh, last year there was uh, severe droughts, worst droughts in 90 years in Brazil. And so there, were a lot, there was a lot of LNG coming in, and the sort of security of supply uh, that our FSRUs were providing really helped Brazil navigate through, through, through that period. Um, and if I bring, come back to the region, um, in Bangladesh, LNG has only been a part of the energy mix since 2018. And today, LNG accounts for about 25% of natural gas supply. But because of the experience of having that security of supply and the re reliability, 
the Bangladesh government is able to make certain decisions around canceling planned coal-fired power plants, uh, increasing the distribution of gas, and allowing that to accompany their renewables targets. So really um, being able to, to plan based on that idea that you have, you can secure the energy transition, that's a term I've heard a, a bit this week, um, that's important. And the way we think about it at, at Accelerate, because we, we operate our FSRUs as a fleet, we could, you know, start with a smaller vessel that has, you know, um, less storage, less regas capacity, and then scale up and maybe do a swap or expand the capacity as the needs change for, for the countries where we operate. You mentioned, you know, gas as a ramp up. Uh, and as we kind of talk about this, you know, the intersection of energy security and climate action, you know, I continue to actually return to uh, a comment, Bino, you made. Uh, and it, it, hydrogen seems to sit at the nexus of that. You mentioned green hydrogen in your, uh, you know, in your initial remarks. I, you know, I don't want to have a conversation about the, you know, all the colors of the wind when it comes to, you know, uh, hydrogen. But I think, you know, can you look, tell us more about the hydrogen potential in the region? You know, especially given that, uh, you know, at least in the short term, we see a lot of gas. Uh, potential in the region and you know that opens up blue hydrogen that opens up additional storage opportunities through hydrogen uh, could you speak a little bit to that please yeah no absolutely uh, i mean first of all uh, we we did publish a report on the geopolitics of hydrogen but an important point is we don't really see green gases and green hydrogen traded in the current way it is being done now with somebody producing uh, gas and then it's being supplied elsewhere. So hydrogen is primarily going to be something which will be produced, hopefully from renewable energy, the green hydrogen, locally, and as a means to balance the grid, plus uh, decarbonize some of these hard to abate sectors. And I think the share of uh, green hydrogen which will be supplied around the world will be a very small amount. Huh? So I think that's important to make that distinction. And uh, uh, within the region, I think the potential or the opportunities are relatively small compared to what is happening globally, where we see that Africa to Europe or Middle East to Europe are the major green hydrogen supply points that we see, particularly in the short term or so. But also, I just wanted to make a point regarding energy security in an interconnected grid where you connect across uh, countries in the region those, when you look at a particular country, small or big, and you only look at your electric grid, which is constrained by your national boundaries, that actually accentuates your energy security. In an interconnected grid, these are not an issue, uh, or no major issues. Today, France, for example, is having major issues with its nuclear power plant, and the electricity for that country comes from renewable energy from up north. And that's happening because Europe has an interconnected grid. So I think interconnections is going to be important and that will give you a lot more flexibility and energy security. And again, it's important to take a longer term perspective to 2040, 2050, where some of these options are much clearer. When you look at a short term energy planning, some of these energy security issues of supply of your fuel actually comes up much stronger. But again, when you talk about uh, supply of a particular equipment uh, or a generating option, which has got some security issues though, but again, once it's installed, then it continues to use local resources to generate electricity for the next 20, 25 years. So there is a distinction between security of fuel supplies and the security of uh, the initial renewable energy conversion equipment. And they are uh, by uh, or orders of magnitude very different. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the important thing to understand is that if you look at the longer term, 2050, we are moving from a mechanical world, which is powered by direct fuel combustion, to an electricity-powered world. And this is really where the energy security paradigm will change. And there, the interconnection across countries is very important. Having a common electricity market like in the Europe is going to be very important. And there will, of course, be importance of diversity there. But again, if you look at the longer term, but of course, make sure that your short term actions are consistent with that, then we may have a, a, a clear view on that. If I can make a, a quick comment, I think, you know, 
I, I generally agree with um, wh what you're saying, but I think we we do need to be considerate of the fact that interconnectivity can also bring its own challenges. Um, and just thinking about the, the gas market um, this past year and, and what's going on in Europe, so one, obviously the interconnectivity of the gas market in, in Europe is leading to this, um, but prior to uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, the LNG and global gas market was already experienced a significant tightness uh, because of global interconnectivity and then weather events that then affected electricity markets. So kind of low hydrogen in Brazil, sorry, low um, hydro in, in Brazil, uh, a cold winter in, in, in Europe, um, less wind in the North Sea, all of that can contribute to then a shortage. And so I think going forward, both in the short and long term, there's going to be no silver bullet. Um, and I think certainly interconnectivity brings a lot of benefits, but we also have to think about what are the challenges that those could do, particularly in a, you know, uh, really, you know, interconnected, uh, electrified market. And so I think having, again, kind of that, that diversity aspect, whether it's fuels or electricity, having that diversity in multiple redundancies is going to be important. Um, I'd also say that I think, um, you know, you never know you need energy security until you already have needed it, right? And so you use the example of, of Germany on, on LNG terminals where I think Accelerate would be very helpful. Um, you know, Germany could have, is talking about uh, bringing those LNG terminals online now, and they could have, they had been talking about it for a number of years. Um, and so, you know, making sure that you have that infrastructure today to meet those needs. And I think we're going to be into um, a really acute challenge in the next few years, um, given the situation in Europe and how that will cascade to the rest of the world. Um, and then, you know, in the future, you know, if, an, if hydrogen um, is able to be commercialized at scale, then we can think about how we repurpose natural gas infrastructure for kind of um, other gases, whether they are any color of the rainbow. Uh, we have about five minutes left, and uh, I don't see any questions in the audience, So, uh, which is disappointing, guys. Um, oh, right there, yes. You gotta ask for you gotta, I thought I asked for questions earlier on. I thought we had a shy crowd. Uh, yeah, I guess just going off of what you just said, talking about um, LNG as sort of this energy security solution that you're thinking about moving forward, is there like an understanding or thought given to how you design LNG infrastructure in the present so that it's functional as that solution in the future? Like I'm um, just talking about CCGT turbines, um, the utilization rate on those and like the flexibility of those turbines, even though they're more efficient in like a base load capacity, they're less efficient than OCGT as flexible capacity. Um, and you're building infrastructure that's gonna be there for 30 years. Um, so you build CCGT that's effective as a base load today, it becomes a flexible, uh, a flexible fuel in the future, and that has the potential to basically be a stranded asset or an asset that becomes less and less effective because of just the usage profile of this infrastructure is different. Okay, that's a great question. I think so, I, I break the two questions up. In terms of how you um, ensure whether or not natural gas and LNG infrastructure can be used for hydrogen in the future, I, I don't definitely do not have an answer for you on that. Um, I think it's something that uh, we and others are, are looking at. I uh, heard recently at, at CIR Week um, that uh, hydrogen being the, the smallest atom uh, leaks as much as methane and it could be a, um, uh, although it's not directly warming, it could have kind of uh, indirect warming effects. I don't know anything about that. That's the extent of my knowledge. So I think something that we need to look into, you know, in terms of um, you know, stranded assets, I think um, if, you, if you build the asset and think about um, from a company perspective, right, um, you know, we are going to build infrastructure in a way that makes sense um, and we can get a return and get a return on that investment so it's paid for. And then in the future, if you're able to then switch the, um, the profile of how you use it, I think that's going to be a different commercial case. And so I think that businesses can handle those um, risks um, with clear and consistent government policy. Uh, we have Phil Cornell in the back. Thanks very much. Um, 
I was very interested to hear about some of Singapore's sort of diversification options. Uh, and one of the most interesting, I think, that's out there is the Sun Cable project and the pro proliferating kind of energy interconnections that are going on. And in fact, they're happening sort of across the region. Um, that's a major change of policy in a place like Singapore. Uh, and obviously, it raises questions in Bangladesh and others where we're seeing a lot of uh, political implications, really, of, of grid interconnection. Uh, I just wanted to make, know, maybe you could speak a little bit about that. What do you think is the future uh, of a regional grid, uh, and what are some of the challenges? Um, thank you very much for that question. Actually, a regional grid has been something we've been talking about in ASEAN for many years. Um, we've been talking about regional interconnectivity on a power basis as well as the Trans-ASEAN Gas Pipeline. Um, so one of the projects that Singapore is working on is a Pathfinder project, um, which involves um, importing uh, electricity from Laos through to Thailand to Malaysia to Singapore. So we actually do have an interconnect with Malaysia for security reasons. Um, but um, as I mentioned earlier, we are actually now looking at actively um, importing this renewable or low carbon energy from within the region. Um, so of course, um, you know, we are open to all options. I mean, I think um, Sun Cable has also mentioned the opportunities um, within, uh, you know, moving from Australia to Singapore. Um, I think in addition to that, we're also looking at, I mean, you brought up hydrogen, for example. I mean, in Singapore, we can't produce the hydrogen. Uh, so we're also looking at what are the opportunities to import hydrogen. I won't get into the colors of the rainbow. I know that's a big debate. Um, but I mean, all of these, um, you know, underpin, I think what we've been talking about, which is diversification, energy security. And I think for Singapore, we are open to all options. Um, we are a price taker. We import all of our energy. Um, so I think whatever to us is, is reliable, secure, competitive, um, and is also sustainable is going to be an option that we're going to want to address. Maybe I could just add something. So yeah, there's been a lot of discussion in Singapore about importing clean energy and I think some of our members have been involved uh, in that uh, and there are RFPs out for that. So one of the things we've done uh, before that can happen is talk a little bit about standards and renewable energy certificates, standards and all uh, measurements and verifications so that what we get into Singapore is truly clean energy because that's another area that can be a little bit um, controversial. So we want to ensure, and we've just, uh, I think we are the first country in Asia to launch the REC standard. And when we import clean electricity, we uh, are looking at how that complies with that standard. That means that electrons that are flowing in are truly clean. Okay, I asked for questions, and I got enough questions to take us over time. But I do want to wrap up the panel uh, with one lightning round. We're going to start at one end, end down here. Uh, and so I want each panelist to say, you know, this is, I think, regardless of uh, how you land on the debate between, you know, uh, which supply chain offers more security, which uh, part of the energy mix needs more examination, you know, what the innovation horizon actually looks like. It's a dynamic region, right? So I, I might, you know, start by saying each one of you, like, what about the region most excites you, right? And what do you think is the, is the next big thing to happen in the region? Um, well, I think what excites me about the region, you know, is that it is a very dynamic and exciting region. Um, I mean, I think we know, um, you know, is Asia is where there is a lot of growth. I think energy demand continues to grow. I think one of the key takeaways that I want to leave everyone with is that, you know, the the end goal of moving towards the energy transition is not something we can do single-handedly. It is a collective goal that we have to work towards together. Um, and um, which is why I would like to invite all of you to join us in Singapore at the end of October, uh, where we run the Singapore International Energy Week. Um, it really is that platform to bring everyone together to really kind of bring the brightest, most creative minds to really find the solutions to some of the energy challenges that we have out there, not only in Asia, but as well as globally. Okay, so she's had the first step. So <laughs> I think what excites me most is that the a big part of the clean energy uh, is going to be produced in our part of the world. Uh, and there's so much opportunity, and I think it's just something that's waiting to take off. Uh, and that's very exciting. And also the, the number of technologies and new uh, solutions. Actually, it's not only technologies. It's also business models that are coming out, which are very interesting. Uh, like solar leasing, where you don't need to own the system, you just buy the clean ele electricity. I think there are going to be many such innovations, both on the technology side and on the market side, which will really drive this forward. Yeah, I would say um, innovating to manage growth. You've got a really dynamic region, population growth, economic growth. 
and some constraints. And so it's going to take a lot of innovation and technology and out of the box thinking to really be able to manage that growth. We've been very impressed with the just energy transition mechanism, which the region is showing, how you can create a financing mechanism now with the ADB and the uh, uh, Indonesian leadership as to make sure that the energy transition is orderly, that there is financing for uh, some of the assets which are likely to be uh, stranded. Uh, and again, this is very different to the South African just energy transition partnership. So the region is probably showing a more market-oriented way to transition, and we find that quite exciting. And we will hope that uh, the lessons from this region in this just transition can be applied to other regions as well. So we're very excited about seeing that uh, just energy transition uh, efforts. Thank you. Um, so, so personally, I'm going to go something that Desiree said, and that was the, the food. Um, incredible diversity, very delicious. Uh, but for professionally, uh, the demand, um, I think, from the region, obviously, from my corporate hat, um, incredible demand for natural gas and LNG, demand for energy. There's a demand for solutions. It's going to require it. No one supply chain is secure. You need everything um, to, to, to get even close to meeting the demand in the next uh, coming years and decades. And so there's going to be a, a number of opportunities or um, solutions that are going to be required. All right, well, there you have it. And it looks like everybody showed up for the last like three minutes of the panel. So uh, to our panelists, uh, Desiree, Kavita, Derek, Binu, Bob, this was wonderful. Uh, just as a logistical announcement, we're going to be convening at 4.30 in the hall next door for our next round of plenary sessions. So why don't we head all over there? But for now, I'd like everybody to thank our panelists for a wonderful session. And uh, thank you. <laughs>